today, by God's grace, we are going to talk about the uh, appearances of the Word of God, the Logos, the only begotten Son of the Father in the Old Testament. We read in uh, the Gospel of St. John, chapter 8, in a dialogue that took place between our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ and the Jews. He said to them, Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day, and he saw it and was glad. Then the Jews said to him, You are not yet fifty years old, and you have seen Abraham? Jesus said to them, Most assuredly I say to you, Before Abraham was, I am. And here we can understand the fact that the eternal Logos of God, who is born of the Father before all ages, is the one who is speaking. And he is making clear that he is the one and same who is the eternal Son of the Father, and yet he appeared in the flesh and the fullness of time for our own salvation. The Word took flesh and became man. So when they were saying that you are not yet 50 years old and have you seen Abraham, they were talking to him as mere human being. Did not, they did not realize that he is the eternal Logos of God who is with the Father co-essential, co-eternal with the Father. The first incident that took place that we can talk about is the appearance of God to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. He was calling them and talking to them. And then we read from the book of Genesis chapter 3 verse 8, and they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And Adam and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So this is one of the very first appearances of the eternal logos of God that we read about in the Bible, in the book of uh, uh, Genesis. Also, God and two angels appeared to Abraham as three men. And we read about this in the book of Genesis chapter 18, how that the three men came and how that uh, Abraham received them and how that God gave him promise saying that I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. God gave him this promise. And after that, we also read that the three angels, two of them went to Sodom and Gomorrah. And it says that Abraham stood in the presence of God. And God said to him what he was going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. This is another appearance of the eternal Logos of God, the Word of God, the only begotten Son of the Father in the Old Testament. Also, God appeared and fought with Jacob till the morning light and then blessed him and gave him the promises. This we read about in the book of Genesis chapter 32. God said to him, let me go for the day breaks. But he said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. And then God asked Jacob saying, what is your name? And Jacob answered saying, Jacob. And God said to him, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. And this is very obvious that the struggle here was taking place with God. Also, God appeared to Moses in the clouds, walking on it. And not only that Moses saw him, but it was Moses, Aaron, 
Nadab and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. We read about this in the book of Exodus, chapter 24. They saw the God of Israel, and there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone, and it was like the very heavens in its clarity. But on the nobles of the children of Israel, he did not lay his hand. So they saw God, and they ate and drank. They saw him in a human form, human shape. Also, God appeared to a man of Zora, of the tribe of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife. These are the parents of Samson. They didn't have no children. And God appeared to Manoah's life, wife first and promised her that she's going to have a son. And then God appeared again to Manoah and his wife. And this we read about in the book of Judges, chapter 13. The Lord also appeared to Daniel in the shape of an old man. Daniel says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Now he's saying that he saw the Son of Man, the eternal Logos of God, the Word, the only begotten Son of the Father, and he saw also he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory, and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. This we read about in the book of Daniel, chapter 7. Also in the book of Daniel, we read that God appeared to the three men in the fire as the Son of Man. Even the king was surprised. He was astonished, and he rose in haste and spoke, saying, to his counselors, did we not cast three men bound into the midst of fire? And they answered and said to the king, True, O king. Then the king said, Behold, I see four men untied and walking in the midst of the fire, yet they are not destroyed. And the vision of the fourth is like the Son of God. This is another appearance of the eternal logos of God in the Old Testament. Also, we can talk about the appearance of our Lord to Isaiah that he tells us about in chapter 6 of the book of Isaiah. When he says, In the year of King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord sitting on the throne, high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Above it stood seraphim, each one had six wings, with two he covered his face, with two he covered his feet, and with two he flew. And one cried to another and said, Holy, 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 and the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his glory. These are few appearances that we gave as an example uh, that our, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, before his incarnation as the eternal Logos of God, appeared in the Old Testament. And this is one of the proofs we can use to prove that he is eternal, co-eternal with God the Father. Glory be to God forever. Amen. Today we're going to continue our talk about the manger. And specifically, we're going to talk about the angels of the manger. We're going to talk about the angels preaching the shepherds and the angels praising the Lord. On the 29th of Kiak, in a lonely field outside of Bethlehem, 
the first candlelight sermon took place. The glorious angel of the Lord was the preacher and the reverend shepherds were the congregation. Let's read uh, Luke chapter 2. And the an angel of the Lord said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring to you good tidings of joy, which will be to all people. For there is a born to you this day in the city of David a Savior who is Christ the Lord. Do not be afraid, a sentence that is repeated so many times in the Bible. However, this, my, this time it carried a special meaning. Why is that? Let's see what was said after it. Do not be afraid, I bring to you. It's a fact. Jesus Christ was born for you, incarnated and died for you to save you. St. Paul felt this and wrote in Galatians 2.20, And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. I bring to you good tidings of great joy. This is our gospel, and this is the message of the Bible. And this message is for everyone at any time. But what is so great about this message? Let's continue reading. For there is a born to you. Note again he, how St. Luke emphasized the use of the word you. There is a born to you. For, is, for there is a born to you this day. Finally the day has arrived. The day the prophets has prophesied. The day the whole creation has waited for. After almost 5,500 years, this day has arrived, and a baby boy was born. But why his birth was so special? Because he is Jesus. When Archangel Gabriel appeared to Mary, he told her, and you'll name him Jesus, which means Yahweh delivers or God saves. For he is Christ, the Messiah, and finally, because he's not just an ordinary man, for he is the Lord. The message delivered by the angels to the shepherds is God's message to everyone, everywhere. St. John Chrysostom commented on this heavenly sermon and said, This day he who is is born, and he who is becomes what he was not. For when he was God, he became man, yet not departing from Godhead that is his. He who is above, now for our salvation, dwells here below, and we who were lowly are exalted by divine mercy. Now let us continue with St. Luke and see what happened afterwards. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of heavenly hosts singing and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace, goodwill towards men. Glory to God in the highest. St. Paul explains this very first Christmas carol in 1 Timothy 3.16 and says, And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God manifested in flesh, justified in spirit, seen by angels. When Jesus was born, the angels saw God for the first time. They couldn't hold themselves, but worshipped, praised Him, and exalted Him, saying, Glory to God in the highest. And on earth peace, for the King of peace is among us right now. And finally, and goodwill towards men. For as Jesus is the sole source of joy for the God the Father, when He incarnated and dwelt among us, God the Father saw His Son in us and He was pleased with us. Jesus reconciled us with God the Father. In the Divine Liturgy of St. Gregory we, say, we pray, But you yourself, without change, took flesh and became man, 
and resembled us in everything except sin alone. You came for us a mediator with the Father, and the middle wall you have broken, and the old enmity you have abolished. You reconciled the earthly with the heavenly, and made the two into one, and fulfilled the economy into the flesh. The quiet, the quiet solitude of that night was shattered when Jesus was born, when heaven touched the earth. That day, Bethlehem resembled heaven. St. Augustine commented on the angel's praise and said, All his angels worthily praise him, for he is their everlasting foot, nourishing them with an incorruptible feast. He is the word of God, by whose life they live, by whose eternity they live forever, by whose goodness they live happily forever. They praise him worthily as God with God, and they render glory to God in the high. The angels praise him dully. Let us praise, let us his people praise him in obedience. They are his messengers, we his sheep. He fulfilled their table in heaven and he fulfilled our manger in earth. He is the fullness of their table because in the beginning was the word and the word was with God and the word was God. He is the fullness of our manger because the Word was made flesh and dwelled among us so that man might eat the bread of the angels as the creator of the angels became man. The angels praise him by living, we by believing. They by enjoying, we by seeking. They by obtaining, we by thriving to obtain. They by entering, and we by knocking, glory to God forever and ever. Amen. Why we celebrate our Christmas on January 7th rather than December 25th, just like other churches, for example, the Roman Catholic Church? Well, ever since I was a little kid, I always wondered what's the difference I used to ask my parents, why do we celebrate Christmas differently from other people? My parents used to tell me, well, that December 25th is the Santa Claus Christmas, and January 7th is the church Christmas. So for me, 25th of December was the fun Christmas, the gifts Christmas, while January 7th was the church Christmas, the big gathering, the big dinner, where we have Lahma, kofta, fata, and all that delicious stuff. Well, let's go back to the history and see what happened. First of all, the Gospel never told us the exact date of birth of Jesus Christ. And if we go back to the early church in the first century, the church never used to celebrate Christmas. So, when did we start celebrating Christmas? Well, the first mention of celebrating Christmas was by St. Clement of Alexandria, where he said that the Egyptians used to celebrate Christmas on 25 of Bashans, and that is 20th of May. However, around the 3rd century, the Roman Church decided to celebrate the Christmas on December 25th. But why December 25th? Why did they pick that date in particular? Well, one of the theories was because there was a tradition, a Judeo-Christian tradition, that Jesus Christ was conceived on the spring equinox. And the spring equinox was March 25th. So if we calculate nine months from that date, his nativity or his birth is going to be on December 25th. However, one of the Protestant scholars started to fight back this theory and he said no this was a pagan feast it was a celebration for the sun the sun however it was converted to a feast for the nativity of the sun son 
However, this was proven wrong. So from the 4th century all the way to the 16th century, all the church used to celebrate the, the Christmas on December 25th, which was 29th of Gak at that time. And all the churches used to follow, and all the whole world used to follow the Julian calendar. Now, what's the Julian calendar? The Julian calendar considers the year 365 days divided into 12 months. And every four years, we have one leap year, where we add an extra day to the month of February. So the actual length of the year in the Julian calendar is 36 and a quarter, 36 five days and six hours. So from the 4th century to the 16th century, the, the Christmas date was 25th of December and 29th of Kak. All the churches used to celebrate Christmas together on the same day. However, in October year 1582, Pope Gregory the 13th noticed that the equinox instead of coming on 21 of March now it comes 11th of March now the spring what's the spring equinox what's the spring equinox the spring equinox is when the sun lies perpendicular to the equator in other words that's when the day equals to the night the duration of the day equals exactly to the duration of the night. Now, why is the spring equinox important? Well, in the Council of Nicaea, we decided that the spring equinox will determine a lot of ecclesiastical feasts. So Pope Gregory gathered all the scientists and the astronauts and asked them why do we have this difference of 10 days. So they told him that the solar year is shorter from the Julian calendar. The Julian calendar we mentioned earlier was 36 5 and 6 hours. However, the solar year is 36 5 days, 5 hours, and 48 minutes and 46 seconds. So there is a difference of 11 minutes and 14 seconds. Now, this seems to be a very minute difference. However, if we add it up, there will be one day for every 128.2 years. So we will be missing one day for 128.2 day, uh, years. So now if we calculate from the 4th century to the 16th century, we're going to have the 10 days difference. So what did Pope Gregory decide to do? First of all, he wanted to make up for all the difference. So he decided that the October 5th, the people will sleep on that day. And when they wake up, it's going to be October 15th. So now he added the 10 days lag. However, however, he wanted to avoid the same mistake happening again. So he came, with a very, he came up with a very smart idea. In the Julian calendar, we have the centenary years. These are the years that are divided by 100. All the years are divisible by 4 are leap years. That is in the Julian calendar. However, he decided that only the centenary years that are divided by 400 will become leap years. Now, on that year, 1582, all the churches celebrated according to the Julian calendar, except for the Roman Church. So when the 25th of December came, it was according to the Gregorian calendar, it was still 15th of December according to the Julian calendar. So people did not celebrate Christmas except for the Roman Church. Now, because 1600, 1700, 1800, and 1900, they're all considered leap years in the Julian calendar and they're not considered leap years except for 1600 in the Gregorian calendar this added extra three days to January 5th so now the question is not which one is accurate is more accurate as we saw 
it's just a matter of using different calendars. And we celebrate our Christmas on 29th of Kiyah, not 7th of January. Because in year 2100, our Christmas, or 29th of Kiyah, will come on January 8th. But the question is not, when was Jesus born? But the question is, where is Jesus being born? Is he born in your heart or not? The question is, how do you celebrate Christmas? Our church makes the best arrangement for Jesus coming. It makes us enjoy the beautiful hymns and the tizbaha and the seven and four of Kiyah so that we all meditate and ponder on the great love of our great Savior who came to our world so that on the Nativity Feast, on the Day of Nativity, we have our own little manger that is ready to accept and welcome the Savior of the whole world. I hope now that you understand the difference why we celebrate on January 7th rather than 25th of December. But again, we do not celebrate on January 7th, we celebrate on 29th of Kiyah. Thank you so much. <laughs>